Hi everyone, we have seen this Gersonov theorem before and we know how useful it is but understanding the concept involves some mathematical intricacies and it's difficult to commit to the maths when one doesn't know how it all comes together. So the purpose of this video is to give a simple visual illustration of what the theorem is about and one can then indulge in the intricacies of the mathematical representation of the theorem or more directly start exploring its wonderful applications. Let's recall the Brownian motion which appears in this differential form in the stochastic differential equations but it's better to visualize the Brownian in terms of its path and distribution. So let's say the horizontal axis represents time which goes from zero to some fixed horizon we will avoid discussion of time going to infinity. So assume the time horizon is large to cover all cases of interest but finite and let the y-axis represent the value of the process. And we know the process can take values from minus infinity to plus infinity. Let's see a few sample paths. The process starts at zero and then goes up and down it's a stochastic process, so the path will take a different shape on each realization. The paths are centered around zero, but not all paths will lie flat. Here goes a couple of wild examples. Now, how does one construct a probabilistic model of this Brownian motion? Remember our mini version of the roulette with only seven pockets? And the probability space was in terms of the triple, the sample space, sigma algebra of subsets of this space and a probability measure respectively. The sample space there was easy. It's just the set of outcomes which are the seven pockets numbered from zero to six and the sigma algebra is not hard either. One can take the power set as a sigma algebra. It will capture all events one might be interested in but there's too many sets and one can usually do with fewer sets. For example, if the game is about batting on the red pockets, then the sigma algebra could be just the four subsets, empty set which captures the impossible events, the whole set itself, and the red and non-red events, and one can then assign probabilities to these events. And in this roulette example, assuming no cheating, the probability of an event would just be the proportion of the play area that the event refers to. Now that was easy, but the question then is, how does one approach the probability space of the Brownian motion itself? It's almost trivial and the reason it has to be so is because the probability space is defined in terms of this triple because it generalizes across settings, so we shall expect no difficulty. Let's see one simple way one can approach the probability space of the Brownian motion. Let's generalize from the roulette example. Let's increase the number of pockets. We can keep going until we can't tell red from black, but I'm going to stop here so that it doesn't become too unfamiliar. And we can also split the pockets along the other dimension. In the end, we will reduce the size of the individual pockets to almost the size of a point. This representation of the play area in terms of the circular region hides the similarity with the Brownian space though. So let's straighten the play area. So it is essentially a trapezium or what you might know is trapezoid. I have shrunk the height so that it fits on the screen at the end of the day. The roulette play area is circular so has to make it work with the spin technology. If we don't have a wheel, we can replicate the roulette game with a different technology, say throwing darts randomly at the trapezium. And now maybe we can pattern individual points and the sample space is now the collection of points in two dimensions. This the points form this two dimensional object. And now it's not hard to imagine the Brownian sample space is a collection of paths. So instead of points, we get paths. And if you look at each path as a function of time, 
is like a continuous function. So technically, we can view the Brownian sample space as the setup continuous function of time. Here, we assume the domain of the function is from zero to some finite horizon as going into the technicalities of infinity will just distract us. And because the Brownian process starts at zero by definition, so we are only interested in those functions that vanish at zero. Now we have the sample space, but we have a new challenge. In the sense that we know the probability of a continuous random variable taking a specific value is zero. For example, in the case of roulette, if you reduce the size of the ball to say the head of the dart, then it's very unlikely that the dart will hit the point you have chosen. Same goes for the Brownian paths. What's the probability that the path will take an exact shape that one draws? So the challenge now is how does one assign probabilities in this space? And this where the sigma algebra of events come into play. In the case of roulette, we partition the play area into pockets. So one particular pocket could be the collection of points in this region. And one can now easily assign probability to this region. The probability could be the area of this region divided by the total area of the trapezium. No difficulty whatsoever. One can define Brownian events in a similar way. Say the path that go through this gate at time t1. So it's capturing all paths whose values lie between say alpha 1 and beta 1 at time t1. But we have functions of time so we can also add gates at other times. And just like in the roulette when we had multiple disjoint red pockets, the gates at a given point can be disjoint intervals as opposed to just a simple interval. And one can then construct sigma algebra of these intervals or what you might call sets. These are called cylinder sets. The term cylinder is defined in the more general sense as opposed to the basic geometrical shape that springs to mind. Probability measure is also easy. We know the Brownian increments over an interval are normally distributed with mean zero and variance equal to the length of the interval. So we can easily construct the probability of the paths that go through the given gates over time. We have seen such probability measure before, but let's simplify the problem so that we focus on the gerson up theorem instead of being distracted by the expressions for probabilities. Let's say we are only interested in the events that happen at maturity. We know the terminal values of these paths will have mean of zero, so let's draw this reference line. And we know the terminal values are normally distributed around this mean of zero with variance equal to the length of the time interval, which is this familiar bell-shaped curve. And we also know the familiar density function. Now we can write the differential of the probability measure as follows. Basic calculus assuming the density exists. And you can interpret dp here as the differential of cumulative distribution function or what we are saying is the probability of the variable taking value in a small region around the value x is equal to density times the length of the interval. The density function is not always defined or known, so that's why the general approach is to write the differential of the probability measure. But we don't have such problems for the Brownian motion, so we can write the differential of the Brownian probability measure in terms of the density. And don't let w underscore t confuse you. It's just a random variable here, just like x. And now we can bring back the cylinder sets. And it's easy to calculate the probability of the path going through these gates. Because the Brownian increments over disjoint intervals are independent and are normally distributed with mean equal to zero and variance equal to the length of the interval. So the probability distribution of the process going from x0 which is 0 to x1 at time t1 will be normal with mean around the starting value 0 and variance equal to the length of the interval which we denote by delta t1 and the probability distribution of the process going from x1 to x2 at time t2 will also be normal but with mean around x1 and variance equal to the length of the interval which is now delta t2 and same goes for the third observation point. So we can represent the 
probability density of the process going from a given starting value to xi over an interval delta ti as follows. And to calculate the probability of the process going from x0 to x1 and then from x1 to x2 and then to x3 by multiplying the three densities. This is because the increments and disjoint intervals are independent. And now to calculate the probability of the path going through the three gates, we just integrate the probability density over the three dimensions. And you can add more gates if you like and, and the limit, you will end up with infinite dimensional integral. The leap from finite to infinite dimensions is easy to achieve because of a very basic probability theorem known as Kolmogorov extension theorem, so no rocket science there. And one can also easily extend the measure to the sigma algebra of such sets. The main point is the same concepts are at play across settings and one has considerable flexibility in defining the sigma algebra and the probability measure. And this is the reason textbooks and articles don't specify the details of the sigma algebra and the probability measure. One can vary the details according to the complexity of the problem one is dealing with and measure defined in terms of terminal values would do for the purposes of explanation. So let's go back to the simpler case, but keep in mind that the logic will work for the complicated cases. Now let's say we have another stochastic process defined on the same space. We can also integrate to write it in terms of the process values. So it is like a transformation of the Brownian process. Remember, change of random variables. So it is a process version of the same concept. Essentially, the process has a positive drift, so it will be drifting upwards over time. But the random component is scaled by 0.6, so it will be less volatile than our Brownian. Since a linear transformation of normal is also normal, so we can say that x is normally distributed with mean rate of 1.5 and variance of 0.6 squared per unit time. It's again bell-shaped but will lie higher because the mean is bigger and will be more peaked because the variance is smaller. To see the two processes, let's simulate a few paths. So the green curve which represents the path of x is trending upwards and has slightly lower fluctuations compared to the Brownian. The source of uncertainty is the same Brownian but the sensitivity to the random component is different. Let's see a few more paths. So you can see x is just a transformation of the Brownian. By the way, the Brownian path can go above the x, for example, if the shock is big positive number, then x will increase by only 60% of the shock plus the drift. The amount it loses and not capturing 40% of the shock can be bigger than the amount it gains because of the positive drift. So w can go higher, but in general Brownian will be below x. Its mean is indeed zero compared to the positive mean of x, so nothing unexpected. Now let's create a copy of this space. We call the original space P because the probability measure we had is P. And let's call the new space Q so we will represent the probability measure of this space by Q. Let's say we want the measure Q to be such that the process X, which has a positive drift under P, will have zero drift under this measure Q. It of course will then turn the process, which was Brownian under P, into a process with negative drift and this process will then not be a Brownian motion under this space. By the way, when I say Brownian, I mean standard Brownian, which has mean zero and variance equal to the length of the interval. We know how a Brownian process will look like under this measure, and let's represent it by tilde, so that we know it's a different process. So the processes W and X are common between the two spaces. They just have different probabilities, and we are showing the process w tilde only under the new space and we shall see that the values of this process can actually be calculated if we know the values of w. Now I said earlier the process w which has zero mean under p will have a negative mean under q but how much negative is the question we want to answer next. The clue to the answer is in the parameters of the process x 
because we wanted this magic Q to turn X into a mean zero process, let's standardize this term containing the Brownian by removing the 0 0.6. So the process X will have zero mean if we just set what we have in the brackets equal to W tilde, which is the new Brownian. And we have thus deduced the relationship between the new Brownian and the old Brownian. Dividing 1.5 by 0 0.6 will give 2.5. And we can integrate to express the relationship in terms of the process values as opposed to the differential. And if we isolate the W on the left hand side, we can see the old Brownian has a drift rate of minus 2.5 under the magic Q. So the drift of X went down from 1.5 to 0 and that of Brownian by more, which is because X has a smaller volatility. It would have been the other way around if X had a higher volatility. Notice the volatilities haven't changed. Let's mention a couple of other facts in passing as well. What happens to the quadratic variation? Would the process X, for example, will have a different quadratic variation under Q? If you answer no, then you're right. And secondly, the space of continuous function hasn't changed, which means the paths which can occur under P can also occur under Q, though probabilities will be different. This means that if a property holds with, say, probability 1 under P, then it holds under Q as well. This means one can choose a convenient measure to facilitate certain proofs, so that's why the theorem is useful. So we have achieved the desired change in drift by changing the probability measure without affecting the volatility. But by how much have the probabilities changed? To see, let's compare the probability distribution of the original Brownian in the two spaces. Here is its distribution under the measure P. And here is its distribution under Q. Let's put the two distributions on top of each other. So you can see the weights have shifted downwards, meaning the probabilities of the process taking higher values have been scaled down, while those of smaller values have been scaled up. We can see it easily if we divide the probabilities under Q by the probabilities under P. The scaling is so variable that we can hardly see what's happening at the top, so let's manually change the maximum value we display to 1. So you can see the values towards the bottom have been scaled by a factor much larger than 1, whilst the values towards the top have been scaled by a factor much smaller than 1. Had we changed the drift the other way, then this scaling would have reversed as well. And let's recall the differential of P we saw earlier. So we know dp and now we know dq by dp. So we can deduce dq. So what is this expression for dq by dp which links the two probability measure? Well this is the famous red on nicotine derivative that we see in the Gerson up theorem. Remember the theorem which we have memorized as follows. Let w be a Brownian motion under p. And if we define a new probability measure Q by this derivative, then W will not be a standard Brownian motion under Q because we have tilted the probability so it will no longer have mean zero. But if we subtract mu times T from the process, then we get the standard Brownian motion under Q. By the way, here we have assumed that the drift is constant, but it doesn't have to be. It can be a function of time or of the stochastic process. Also, the theorem requires that the red on nicotine process be a martingale, and there are several criteria that provide sufficient conditions for the process to be a martingale. So one can use one of these criteria to check that the process is a martingale. Coming up with the sufficient conditions used to be in industry once upon a time, but nowadays most textbooks will mention the Novikov conditions, which is not hard to check. But here, we don't need to worry about the technical conditions because the drift is constant and we can easily check that the process is a local martingale by using Ito's lemma. Remember, we have to show that the drift is zero. And if we can then show that the process is bounded, then we can claim that the process is a martingale. So we don't have a lot to worry about. So this 2.5 is the drift scaled by the standard deviation. While we have two different probability measures, 
We can set the technicalities aside and assume that we get the same realizations of the random numbers in the two panels. This will help us visualize how equivalent paths will look like under the two measures. Everything seems expected. So the random processes X and W under measure Q have the downward drifts compared to their values under the measure P. By the way, it would be good to predict how the processes will look like under Q every time we show a new realization of W and X under P. So let's see another realization. Now time to predict how these will look like under Q. Ready with the answer? Let's see the result. Let's try another example. Ready with the prediction? So the processes are drifting downwards compared to what we see on the left hand side. Also. Notice the gap between X and W is bigger under Q. Remember, why is this so here? And what would have made this gap smaller? Is it the velocity of X? Let's see a couple more examples. Time to predict. Last try. Are we ready to see the results? Right, so we can see that the same processes have different drifts under the two panels and the two panels have equivalent but different probability measures. Now, what are some of the common things that one does with probabilities? Compute the probabilities of events and expected values of random variables or processes here. So let's see how these calculations compare under the two measures. Let's start with the probability of an event A. So the event A here represents the terminal value of the Brownian falling in this range. We can represent the probability of this event under probability measure Q as follows. Now the probability of this region will just be the sum or integral to be precise of the probability density over this region. We want to express this in terms of probability measure P. So we can use the red on Nicogen derivative to write dQ as Z times dP. Just as an aside, we can also write this using the indicator function. So here, 1 underscore a is an indicator function which takes a value of 1 if the random outcome is in range a and 0 otherwise. And similarly, we can express the probability of a under q using this indicator function. So it kind of amounts to summing the probabilities over the range a. And now it's an easy matter to deduce the relationship between the expectations under the two measures. Let's start with expectation of a random process x under the magic q. We can write the expected value as integral with respect to the differential of the probability measure. Now we use red on Nicodem again to write dq as z times dp. And now this is how one would write the expected value of x times z under the magic p. So you can see the expected value of x under q is equal to the expected value of x times z under p and this relationship comes in handy in simplifying the calculation of expected values and finally we define the red on nicotine in terms of the final time which is enough for problems where the quantities of interest depend only on the terminal values there are two things firstly how does one define and use red on nicotine for an earlier time this might be the case, for example, for calculating the expected value of a cash flow that depends on the Brownian motion value at an earlier time. Does one has to define a new probability for every possible horizon? Secondly, it's true that the full uncertainty will be resolved by the chosen finite horizon, but the Brownian process values will be revealed over time, so we'll get to know more of the path as time progresses. So does one has to define a new probability measure for each filtration as well? The answer to both of these questions is no. The red on nicotine derivative for an earlier horizon is just the conditional expectation of the red on nicotine derivative defined using the final time. And we thus get the red on nicotine derivative process. The dq by dp is usually denoted by z. And now we can take expectation conditional on the filtration. As an example, let's take the red on nicotine derivative we saw in the Kirsten-Up theorem. Can you try to calculate its expected value conditional on the filtration at time s? You just have to divide the Brownian between the known and unknown parts. W underscore s will be known by time s 
and wt minus ws is then the increment from s to t. We can take the known quantities out of the expectation and then use the property that the expected value of the exponential of the normal is equal to the exponential of the mean and half the variance and the mean of the Brownian increment is zero and the variance of the increment is equal to the length of the interval. We can combine the mu squared terms so the t's cancel and we get s. Is this what we would have expected to get had we set horizon equal to s? So defining the red on negative derivative process means we can use the same probability measure for all horizons and one doesn't have to define a new probability measure for each filtration or each horizon. And to link the conditional expectation under Q to the one under major P, we can make use of the Bayes theorem. This is just a more general version of the Bayes theorem one sees in elementary probability books and the denominator as we saw earlier with just equal ZS and we can also write the ZS separately to make it more readable and we can also take ZS inside the expectation because it is like a non-quantity conditional on the information we have at time S. So essentially we are splitting the red and negative into the known and unknown parts, quite intuitive. Please give a thumbs up if you would like to see similar videos and I look forward to seeing you in the next.